Before I introduce uh, Hassan, let me give you some additional information on our seminar series. We started the collaboration with Exeter University, and uh, every month, so we will have a joint Exeter Computer Science, Plymouth Computer Science CRNS seminar series. This means that once a month they come to see us, and once a month they, we can go to see them. They do seminars on Thursdays, we do seminars on Fridays. Uh, so at some point in the website we will advertise about the seminar series. They will be here on the 6th or 5th or 6th the Friday of May when we have a Japanese speaker, Okata. Actually on the day we might have two speakers, but I'm not sure, so they will come here. And then we will go there later on uh, 15th of June. Are the master students around? There we go. I, I will say it's yes. okay. Yes. Okay. You are welcome to come. It's possible for us staff to start to okay. speak to each other and collaborate. Of course, you are welcome to come. I'm afraid we don't fund the traveling. So if you live in Exeter, uh, then uh, we will announce this. So once a month, only two days before this academy year, then it will be a bit more systematic. We do lots of machine learning, big data uh, optimization, which complements what we do. So putting this aside, let's go back to the standard CRNS seminars. So it's my honor to introduce this very young professor, he's already a full professor, uh, Professor Sam Ugei from Bradford University. He studied mathematics, Andrea is smiling, in Roman. He studied mathematics at King's College and then PhD in applied mathematics at uh, Leeds University. He liked a lot of England and so he's been there since then in Bradford. And you will see, we were discussing this before, when you are a lecturer student, you should really be focused on your research. You should be doing almost one thing or maybe one and a half. When you are a lecturer, you keep one and then you start to diverge. When you are a professor, you are supposed to show breadth of experience and applications and uh, scientific directions. And I think we will see a nice example today. I hope so, yeah. Thank you very much, Angelos, for inviting me. It's a really pleasure to be here, to be honest. Uh, but Angelos said I'm, uh, I'm young, so um, I will start with a question. How many of you can get, uh, guess my age? <laughs> <laughs> Give us some ranges. No, I'm not giving you any ranges. Tell me you. 35? No. Oh. Oh. I'm a professor, so. <laughs> 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 I'm 46. Oh. But the reason why I look young is in a minute that it's, it's a question, it's, it's a talk for everybody, because I, I practice a lot of longevity, so I know a bit about longevity, so I'm practicing. Um, longevity, so that's probably why I look here and there. So, but that's the topic for another time. Yeah. How long does it take to become a professor? I don't think it matters. Okay. Anyway, so, um, as Angelos mentioned, uh, I will be covering a lot of work. In fact, actually, I will be covering um, about for uh, 15, 20 years of work. In a sense, it's a story of kind of my research life, if you could imagine it. In, in these PowerPoints, in, in this talk, really, to me. Uh, so deliberately, I, I, I made it open, I put it at like visual computing, but that's because I want to capture certain things, and then hopefully everyone uh, in this room will go away with something, hopefully, yep. So, uh, I have been in the, um, in the uh, University of Bradford for the past 15, 20 years now, uh, and at the moment, I also lead a center called Center for Visual Computing. So let me talk a little bit about what we do so we are kind of very interdisciplinary, so we, we, we bring in computational, physiological, psychological expertise. And we work on things like visual media, biometrics, security, perception, and gaming. So this is very broad things, but the heart of it is actually computation, if you can imagine. So these are some of the examples, but I'll, I'll talk more about that later on. So things like real-time imaging systems, uh, surface representation, data compression, 3D vision, surface rendering, perception, motion tracking, these are things. I mean, it's not something that I do all of this, because we've got a bunch of other researchers, academics, PhD students, and uh, other researchers working on it. So I will be focusing mostly what I do and my students do. So that's basically uh, what our center stands for. And we are one of the six research centers uh, which was internally funded by Bradford to actually look into these things. And uh, we have a whole host of resources and facilities so that includes uh, laser scanning, thermal uh, cameras, tracking equipment, and generally, you know, most of the hardware and software that you need these days to actually run this sort of dilemma. So we've got those things uh, in place. 
So basically, what, what is visual computing? I mean, you might be asking that question. So different people actually define visual computing in different ways. So this is how we define it. Okay, so you have a series of data sources, images come from camera or video, motion capture data. Everybody is familiar with motion capture. Yeah, so you put a bunch of gloves on your body and then you move about to take the, the, the you take the motion and you transfer it to character. So this is what they do in, in films and movie making. Uh, and 3D scanning, thermal images. So these are all sensor images, sensor data, we could imagine. And then we feed, we can use this sensor data for compression, representation, uh, processing analysis and visualization and make a decision out of it. So basically that's what we do as a whole. So you've got a self sensor data, you do some sort of analysis on it, you need to come up with a decision. So that's what we do. Uh, this is how we define the visual computing. So at the heart of it is things like image processing, data representation, data compression, visualization, analysis, and obviously machine learning. So those are the sort of things that are the um, heart of it. So let's, I mean, we all like to actually put some challenges, don't we? As researchers, we actually put these grand challenges and say, if you can solve this problem, then you can solve most of the problems that come by. So I like to actually point out two problems, two challenges that are kind of, if you can solve those two challenges, most of the things that we see, most of the problems that we can see will be solved. So, one is di digital data, highly large sensor data, and then the other thing is machine intelligence. So these are kind of major, major, major technical challenges that we face today in the 21st century uh, in, in this domain. So, and the main important thing is, I'm, I'm sure you would have heard of the Uncanny Valley. How many of you heard of Uncanny Valley? Yeah, if you're doing robotics, I'm sure you would have heard of it. So basically, if you're designing a robot at initial stages, if it doesn't look like a human, it's kind of very appealing because you can't relate to him because it's, it's, it's a machine. But the, the sooner you start relating to a machine, you start disliking it until it becomes really real. Yeah. So this is the point where we are at the moment. Yeah. Whether you are designing a robot, whether you're creating an animation, that's where we are. So that's actually moving away from this uncanny valley is the biggest challenge. Yeah. So I'll show you a couple of videos. I want to see. I want to do a little test. Uh, so what I'll show you is, I'll show these two videos, and you will need to tell me which one is actually computer generated and which one is real, okay? So let's see, hopefully there's, there's sound. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter that much if the sound is not, let me just check. Mm Actors captured on video, and then the video is analyzed by our computer software, and the actress' performance is used to drive any facial break. Okay, let me run again. So. Well, the actor is captured on video, and then the video is analyzed by our computer software, and the actress' performance is used to drive any facial break. Okay, that's the first video. Look at me. So which one is real and which one is computer generated? One of them is definitely computer generated. The one on the right, but it must be a trick. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked the question, yeah? yeah. Well, so the one <laughs> which one is real? Is this one real? Yeah, yeah. Does this one? No? no. 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 What is no. your trick in this? <laughs> yeah, there's a trick in there. In fact, they're both computer generated. Oh! <laughs> Now, now, now you can see all the confirmation bias coming, but did you really see it? No. But, yeah. but it's hard to see, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No. yeah, but if I say that one is real and one is not real, then obviously you collect evidence yeah. to support what you believe, right? Yeah. So, you know. so that's okay. But the point is, this is almost breaking the uncanny belly. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? But clearly this is not. Yeah? And they spend millions of dollars to actually create something like that. Because of they start with motion capture and then taking, developing a character which actually looked at it, they, they took 3D scans of her face and then they did the animation on, on top of it with the motion capture. So that's almost like, you know, that's, so you need to do so much work to get to that point to actually get it real, yeah? So that's what I meant by uncanny valley. And he, here are a couple of problems that you could solve. If you could solve these things, you more or less solve, 
you know, most of the challenges in, <laughs> in machine learning and AI. So, counting the number of chairs in this image. If you can solve that, you've solved a lot of problems. You know, give this image to your algorithm and say how many chairs. Yeah? It's impossible for uh, an algorithm to do it right now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But that's where we are heading to. If we can do this, we can kind of solve most of the problems. How many legs? For us, a human being is actually very easy. A computer will say that's also a leg, you know, because it doesn't it wouldn't recognize it. So those are kind of two, two very simple examples. If we can solve those two simple examples, we more or less kind of done. You know. Okay. So what I want to do is next, I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about kind of a contribution that I made to this field. Just a little contribution that I made to this to this field in terms of. The, the previous video I saw in terms of actually creating 3D modeling and generating this data and actually using this. So the question when I started doing my PhD, the question I asked was, and if you're PhD students, I'm sure you should ask this question, a question, yeah? So the question I asked was, what is the most efficient way to actually represent what you see in the real world in a computer? Okay, what's, how would you do that? So I see you, mm -hmm. I, see, I see my face, I see, other, uh, I see all this stuff. Yeah, which are real. How can I realistically represent it inside a computer? But that question obviously hasn't been answered yet. Yeah, but my little contribution to that is I, I started working on on the geometry itself. So what we do is we actually capture the geometry or we approximate this geometry. So I can look at somebody's face, I can try and estimate the shape and and, and the texture and things like that, and then I can try and, and replicate it inside the computer. So when I started working this, so here is the example. So this is basically the, the generated test, but the process that goes through is this. You, you, take, you, you actually create a computer model, you take the, the, the scan data and create the computer model, and then you take uh, the motion data, and then you actually apply it and then generate the dynamics. Yeah? But I was interested in mostly in this, which is how, how you could actually efficiently create this 3D, 3D geometry. Yeah? At that time, people were looking at things like splines, and techniques, but we, we, we start looking at a very radical way to the, at this problem. So let me explain how we did it. So I want to go to a little bit into a little bit into mathematics, but not too much. I want to start with a problem called heat. Okay? So this is a problem where you have a bar, a metal bar, okay, insulated both ends, supply heat from one end and supply heat from one end. Okay? Now the question that you want to ask is but well, the question I ask is, at steady state, the temperature around this bar is kind of uniform, okay, at steady state. How could I predict the temperature T at any point? Now, we don't have to do this because this has been done ages ago in, in, the, in the 16th century by a guy called Laplace, yeah? So, Laplace came up with an equation called Laplace equation. If you actually saw the subject to these heat, H1 and H2 up there, if you saw Laplace equation, you can get the heat, so it's not a big thing. You can you can find out the, the temperature at any point in this. So you might be wondering. So, so there's an, other interesting things happening. So the internal temperature depends on the heat applied the boundary. The heat distribution is constant throughout, and then the temperature will not exceed the temperature you supply from these both ends. So these are interesting things that are happening in there. You might be wondering why am I talking about heat? Now I talk about phases and and data, but there's a connection. <coughs> so. You saw the Laplace equation. This is your Laplace equation. You can get the heat at any point in, in, in this. Yeah. So what we were interested in is actually turning this problem into a geometric modeling problem. Okay. So how do we do it? You have heat. So if you imagine this is some sort of boundary condition. This is some sort of boundary condition there. And if you saw the temperature at this point is is a shape. If you actually plotted that shape, you get a geometry out of it. Okay. Now here it is. So if I wanted to create this shape, okay, there's a boundary there which is called an edge. There's a boundary here which is called an edge, and also there's a direction which which this boundary will move into the interior. There's a direction which which this boundary will move into the interior. So I can take four boundary conditions. This is not Laplace. This is the a higher order equation called biharmonic, but it's actually twice Laplace if you can imagine. Uh, but I can supply these boundary conditions, solve this equation. And if I plotted the solution of that equation, I get a surface, okay? Now this surface, I can actually start controlling using those boundary conditions because this surface, the shape of this surface depends on those, 
Yeah, I can start changing these, and I can mm -hmm. start changing the, the, the geometry itself. So it's a neat way of representing geometry. All you do is you take the characteristics, the character lines of an object, formulate a boundary value problem, solve the PD, and the solution of the PD is the geometry. Okay? So, uh, so that's kind of the basis of my PhD. And, and we don't really need these meshes, so with, with these data points, you don't really need the meshes. All you need is the boundary conditions. And, and there's an intuitive way of actually explaining this or understanding it. If, if, you, if you happen to be an artist, if, you, if I ask you to draw my face, how would you go about doing it? You don't go about jotting points on my face and then interpolating between these points, which is what most of the geometry modeling techniques do. Yeah? But what you would do is you would actually look at my face, find out the prominent characteristics of my face. Yeah? For example, my the symmetry profile, the length, the eye profile, and things like that. And what you're doing is you're actually taking the characteristics. And based on those characteristics, you fill in the between. And this is exactly what's happening here. You take the characteristics of this object, and then you apply it for those characteristics into the PD, and the PD does the rest. OK? So all of these objects, you can see, they are mm -hmm. solutions to a partial differential equation. In fact, you can actually generate any object that you like, or you can think of, using the solution to the biharmonic equation. In this case, this is not just one biharmonic equation, but a series of biharmonic equations, but they generate this shape. So it's a very nice way of actually parameterizing geometry and explaining geometry. So, so you, 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 know, you, you see an object, it's a solution to an equation, it's a partial differential equation. Okay, if you're interested in more about this, I've written a book on it, so you can, you can get it on, on Amazon and read it if you're really interested in this. Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you some, some examples of some of the work that we've done using, using this method. So this part of my early career, we had some really nice, interesting EPSRC grants and other grants where we were looking at this, but we were interested in practical applications of this. So I'm almost, I'm very much interested in the actual practical application of research, so I started looking into this. And we had an EPSRC grant where we were looking at modeling and animation using these things. So this was with VAR and Autodesk. So what I, I'll show you a little video here. This video, if you look at it, uh, forget about the jittery things here because this is actually nothing to do with it, it's just the way it's actually captured. Um, so this is not a real video, by the way, this is a computer-generated video. So it's, everything is done by computer. But I want you to focus this on these fish. Now these fish are partial differential equations. Okay, All of these fish that you see, they are solutions of partial differential equations. That equation I showed you is actually, so whether it's a big fish or a small fish, Whatever type, shape of fish it is, they are partial differential equations. So whenever I see a fish in here, I see it as a, as a solution to a partial well, biharmonic equation, can you imagine? So that's just an, a, a, a neat example of how you can use the partial differential equations to generate the geometry and also to do the animation. Of course, in this case, I showed you in the previous example, it was a static object. But if you put time parameter on one of those things, you can actually start moving this. And then you can solve, start solving the partial differential equation and you can generate this, please. So here's another one where we were looking at uh, faces. I talk faces a lot, because I'm very much interested in faces recently. So here, what we're doing is we're taking motion from one uh, character, and then applying that motion to another character. This is what they do in, in, uh, in um, filmmaking and animation, so they will have stand <coughs> motion uh, recorded uh, through motion capture or something, and then they apply to a character. So, you can see it's, it's the same, it, well, this is me, and this is a colleague of mine, and this is Robert De Niro, by the way. Did you recognize him? <laughs> yeah, well, it's his, his, his character, yeah. So we, we apply this to, uh, to many, many areas. In fact, I've got uh, five patents in this area in, in data compression, which now have been all assigned to a company called Tangentix, which is in Sheffield. So uh, Tangentix is a university spin-out company uh, which has raised about five million pounds so far and still haven't made any money, <laughs> interestingly. But what they're doing is very interesting. So they're taking our PD idea uh, and they're taking existing computer games and then looking at the data. So you have the texture data, you have the uh, visual other data, the, the mesh data and things like that. And they're using our PD to compress it. So they're looking at the characters, those, those character lines and things. 
and then you can throw away the actual mesh, and then you can represent the actual geometry in terms of um, the equations. So here is an example. <coughs> Here's a very early example of when we start identics. So you, you can see a character here. Now this character is, is a PD equation. It's a partial differential equation. But the interesting thing here is this is real-time simulation of it, and, and there's no mesh as such. It's actually computing the equation at any given time. It's real time computing that equation. So when the character is near, you still you're doing the same computation when the character is far. You know? And then you can in real time see it at any, any kind of resolution because you're computing it in real time. You can look at any resolution you like. So this is being used now in existing computer games. What they're doing is they actually take existing computer games, compress the data, put it online somewhere so that people can actually play with it. Play, play. You, you, you don't really need to download game data to your device. You can have all the data up there, but you can stream them. Because all you do is you stream the character lines of that object or that, that, that texture. And then you have a PDE solver on your hardware. On your and then you, you can solve PDE. It's a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of odd things in, in, in this. But if you're really interested, I don't know how many of you are game players. If you're really interested, you should go to these game sessions, which is about um, uh, tangentics. Uh, um, this is their website, gamesessions.com. You can play for free. And um, there's loads of uh, recent PC games in there, which is all kind of PD part, if you imagine. So it's all kind of using our technology. And it's, it's real now. So it's actually, you can download the games and play. play. But we haven't so far made any money yet. But I think apparently they're talking with Amazon and Microsoft. And hopefully we, may, we might get some money out of it. Yeah. So, Why should we be no profit? Uh, <laughs> because. Um, so it's a venture capitalist. This was, the funding was given by venture capitalists and they brought in a bunch of people. Uh, so I was there, I was with the company for a year and a half and they, they cut me off after a while because they, they knew everything so they didn't really need to. I mean, we did a technology transfer, so it's all now business. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing is they have um, a lot of high profile people on, on, on board. For example, the chairman of Tangentics is the ex CEO of Sony. So in Europe, so so it's it's pretty big, you know, what they're doing. So um, to raise five million of venture capitalist money, it's not easy. So anyway, I didn't do much of it. I, I didn't do the fundraising bit. I only did the tech transfer. So, but but it's interesting to see yeah. your work being used in, in other areas. Okay, so <coughs> so that's kind of the first part of kind of my my research. You know, for the first good years, I was doing this stuff. I did the compression. I I, I did the PDE stuff. Then suddenly what happened was um, I, I got a grant to actually start looking at faces. Okay? Uh, that was actually looking at uh, geometry of 3D face and 3D face recognition. At, at that time it was a huge problem, it's still a huge problem, to actually do 3D face recognition. And I got a grant to do it, I got a PhD student to work with me, and I got interested in faces. And ever since then I've been working on faces, but I do other things, I do my PDE work, I do my so all my rec papers and things are still on, on the PDE stuff, which is still the mathematics, mathematical part. But um, I, I have been interested in phases. So the, the rest of the talk mainly will kind of um, be around phases, if you like, because I have been interested in phases. And there's so many interesting questions to be, to be answered on phases. Uh, and uh, I, I think so many interesting questions that are not answered yet. Yeah. So, Face recognition, 2D, 3D, I've uh, been interested, I'm particularly interested in facial analysis, emotion analysis, and we have uh, a number of PhD students who are looking at emotion analysis in our lab. Uh, gender, ethnicity, age estimation, age progression, these are things that I'm interested in in, uh, in our uh, in faces. So let's start with the <coughs> this project. This was uh, years back we were looking at 3D face recognition. So the, the idea was you have a captured face in 3D. This is using a scanner. Okay. Uh, a typical 3D facial uh, uh, facial data will be about a megabyte of data. So if you went and captured your face, it will be typically a megabyte of data. Now you might think this is a small cell, but if you imagine the whole UK population, you know, 3D scan now that's a huge data set. Forget about searching the data set. Storing itself is a big problem, yeah? So what we do is we actually look at the PD file in a sense. So we take character lines, yeah. So you can take things like um, you can you can preserve 
specific feature point. So one, one feature point that you, you would want to actually preserve is the symmetry profile. The symmetry profile is the line that divides the face into two halves. So there's an interesting thing. In 2D, if you take identical twins, it's very difficult to actually distinguish between the two. If you saw identical twins for the first time, it might be very difficult to distinguish between them. But if you actually scan a three, the 3D case of identical twins, and if you look at their symmetry profile, <coughs> which is the line that, that is the profile that divides the face in three dimension, they are unique actually. So the line, that, the, the, the symmetry profile is actually unique even, even in the case of identical twins. So this is why 3D case recognition is important then compared to 2D face recognition. But there's a huge challenge in 3D face recognition. First of all, the hardware is not ready yet. Because capturing a face is, is very difficult. I mean, in an airport scenario, in fact, uh, in fact um, we try and test it, with, try test it at Heathrow Airport when we first start developing it. So they give us something like a minute for somebody to scan and recognize. But it takes more than a minute to even scan the face to start with. So the problem is actually not the recognition bit, the problem is the hardware, the, uh, the actual capturing for the moment. So be parked to that for the moment until the hardware gets, you know, by, but well, the, the recognition part is there. But so that project is, I don't think there's any 3D face recognition system in the world. And I think it will take years for us to develop very efficient ways of actually capturing 3D at the moment. Um, so, and then we start working on facial analysis. I got another grant, really interesting grant, to look at light detection. So this was a project where we were look with every Smith UK board agency. We were uh, we asked the question: Can you look at somebody's face? Not not you, but can a computer look at somebody's face and tell whether the person is lying or not? This was the question we wanted to answer. <laughs> so it was a really interesting three-year project. So what we had was uh, a, a video camera, which actually captures your face while you're talking. <laughs> And a thermal camera, which actually looks at the temperature profile of the face. So you're looking at two modalities here, the temperature and, and the visuals. Um, so the idea was, can we actually do this? So why, why light detection? Apparently, this is a big problem um, in, um, in people smuggling and things like this. For example, if you look at Calais port, uh, there's about 9,000 lorries. And then there are about 3,500 uh, positive uh, people that come into UK. So it's a problem. Apparently the, the person who is driving the lorry, the lorry driver knows about it. So if you could interview the lorry driver, maybe you could. So this was one argument that we put forward to get it. So of course at the moment they have things like heartbeat detectors. Uh, they can probe into this and monitor the CO2. If people are there, you will have high concentration of CO2. Visual, canine, and things like that. Um, but what we were interested in is actually developing a completely non-invasive, which means you shouldn't be able to touch the person or even in covert situations you don't even know whether you'll be monitored or not, yeah? So, uh, so the question was, a system that is completely non-invasive should be based on reading face, only face, not other parts of the body, just the face, um, and it should be a modern alternative to polygraph. So that's what the question we, we started asking. So those are, those are the kind of basis. So we start looking at the visual part, uh, the video, so this is how it, you start looking at the visual part, and you start looking at the action units. Some of you might be familiar with this. So in the face, there are a certain set of muscles, and the muscle movement, you can start looking at those muscle movements and, and tracking those points around the muscles. You can try and identify these action units, and based on those action units, you can identify the, uh, what state of the person is, whether happy, surprised, anger, disgust, set, or fear, whatever it is. But there are other, other bunch of other emotions in, in there. But those are the sort of basic emotions we work with. So we developed some software to, to try and track the face and to try and understand the emotion. And then, and then you do the analysis. Uh, so this is part of the software. Uh, I don't know if this is working or not. This is, um, yeah, so it is working, yeah. So this is actually our really early work. We don't use this anymore because I don't, I don't believe this actually works because what we're doing here is we're actually tracking individual points on, on the face, and then we're tracking these, two, these points as we go along. So obviously this, this is subject to many things like lighting, variations, and many other things. So um, unfortunately, this sort of algorithm doesn't work. That's what we found out. So we've shifted from that after the project, of course, we shifted into looking at patches. So this is, so for example, if you are trying to analyze my emotion right now, you wouldn't actually look at my eyebrow and drop three points there and, 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 and you know, fix those three points or mouth corner and then look at it. 
What you do is you look at patches of my face. So maybe you might look at my cheek, my mouth area, my eyes, my forehead, and then you try and guess. You estimate what's happening around, around them. So this is the exact way of we're trying at the moment. Um, and so we take this patch-based idea and then we, we, we run optical flow-based algorithms to actually uh, understand what's happening around the actual motion. And based on that, we can fairly accurately get the motions out. So um, here's a, a, a graph which actually shows, um, I told you we, we were working on the thermal domain as well. So we're looking at thermal. So this is from our thermal camera. You can see the variations in temperature. Um, even this is actually the person is telling you the truth. You still see that those big variations, you can see. Uh, but we've taken, those three, we've taken three points. So we mostly look at the eye area because the skin around the eye area is thinner compared to the rest of the face. So you can start seeing more of what's happening. In fact, the camera we have is very sensitive. It can actually probe from about two or three meters. You can probe to your eye periorbital area and look at the blood flow pattern in the eye area. So from the blood flow pattern, you can probably recognize uh, what's going on. Um, so the experimental setup, what we did was we actually uh, asked the uh, students to come over and we, we gave them a story. In, in, one, in one case, they asked to actually tell the truth. And on the other case, they asked to tell the lies and then we recorded the, their facial emotions and also the thermal imaging and things like that. And that's how, so, so the way, <laughs> It works is because everybody has some sort of a baseline. So I don't know. I mean, people get worked up or people get nervous at different situations. So we can easily interpret nervousness as lies. Yeah. So everybody has some sort of a benchmark. So the way we, we run the lie detector now is we will start with asking you, like, say, ten questions for which we know the answer. So, for example, like if I ask Angelo's his name, there's no need for Angelo to actually lie. So he can tell me his, his age. So we can actually record his facial. Uh, emotions and facial movement and the thermal profile. So that gives us the baseline for angels, and then we can record that baseline. And then if you start integrating, in, in, interrogating with him, we start lying. Obviously, then you start moving away from, from the baseline. That's where we start looking. And it's sort of statistical, if you can imagine. And then we look at the overall score. So if we, if we give, if, if, if we ask Angelos a question, although we have the baseline, if you ask a question, if you answer, it's just one question we wouldn't be able to tell whether it's actually true or that because it doesn't work like that. It's an overall thing. So obviously this sort of things generate lots of publicity. So we were like at one point like all over the media, uh, BBC News, CNN, and everywhere, um, you know, these this stories were reported. But interestingly, I have to be honest, we didn't actually find too many kids for that detection. It was sort of disappointing in one sense. Uh, when we start um, working on this experiment, I thought we'll have something really fascinating where we will have really interesting results and I can just like, you know, people are saying, can you do an app? And then I just, you know, <laughs> show it to my wife, you know, <laughs> and then <laughs> picture, you know, video my wife and then see whether she's lying or not. But that sort of thing, people were very excited, but unfortunately we didn't actually find many, many cues on, on, on light detection. But there are some cues, there are some cues uh, for light detection. So I'll show you some cues. So here is, for example, a cue for light detection. Although this is not guaranteed. So this is a, called the slip of the tongue. If you look at it around the mouth area, you'll see, yeah, which is a slip of the tongue. But this is very high resolution camera, but obviously you, you know, in, in, in real life, you wouldn't be able to see these sort of things. Uh, frequent swallowing is, is, is a cue. is what we call the facial asymmetry. So if you look at somebody's face, you can divide the face into two halves, okay, through the symmetry line. And then you can start looking at the two halves separately. And you start seeing some really interesting things happening because one half can be happy, the other half can be angry. Have you noticed? Obviously not, because humans are very poor in that detection. Actually, flipping coins do a better job than humans. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Um, we are very good in lying. <laughs> very poor in light detection, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So the facial asymmetry is one of the things that we look at, which is something. And then also the temperature change. Sometimes there's a tenth of a degree change in temperature around the area. But that's not always the case. So these are kind of, you know, 
of some of the cues for that emotion. So, yeah. Were these cues consistent with what we knew already from the psychology literature? Yeah, so they, 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 yeah, because the asymmetry is one of the things that even in psychology they report. But they report a bunch of other things, things like the lip wipe and things like that. They are not always the case. And sometimes they even say look left, look right, but they, they don't work. But to be blunt, I think lie detection is a very, very difficult topic because we don't really, there's no definition of lie detection, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there's spontaneous lying and there's plain lying. Plain lying is almost like telling the truth. I have a story in my mind, I come and you interrogate me. I've already formulated the story. I believe that's truth. If I formulated the story in my head, obviously I, I believe it's truth. So, I, uh, so the, the activation doesn't happen. But spontaneous lies are interesting. Because in spontaneous lies, you see the asymmetry and the temperature things and things. But it can be nervous. Mm. Yeah. So it can be misinterpreted as, you know, as lies. So the way we see at the moment is this will actually not be a system where we simply just let somebody uh, take an interview and use it for lie detection, but it could be something that can help the interrogations. Oh yeah, sorry, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah. How does it occur uh, with regards to sarcasm then? Yeah, this is it. And the question, I don't know, the question is, there's so many unanswered questions here, so um, sarcasm is probably planned in a sense, isn't it? In, in a sense, is it not planned? I don't know. I mean, if you, had a, if you had some sort of story in your head, if you believe in something, this is what politicians do, isn't it? So they will start with a small lie and then keep repeating it. And then after a while they even believe their lies. So for, for, the, for, for so it becomes very difficult. So um, there are different methods to detect lies. So polygraph is a standard thing, yeah. But even polygraph is not sure. It's not. But comparison is what you do. Uh, yeah, uh, we get similar sort of results. But we are doing completely non-invasive, that's the thing. We do completely non-invasive. <coughs> After the question regarding your, your group, you ask the students to lie. Do they, did you do any incentives for them to lie? Do, yeah. do they have any stake in actually Yeah, yeah so they, they get paid. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, because they're yeah, like... Yeah, because uh, even then it's a little bit kind of staged, isn't it? Yeah. Because, you know, you know, you're asking somebody to lie. But there's another interesting thing. I mean, we didn't actually do this experiment, but uh, they found out that, that good lights are actually good light detectors as well. Mm -hmm. You realized it? So, so this is why you should, uh, you should employ criminals to catch other criminals, <laughs> because they know that the kind of mentality and, and the way they talk, yeah? Anyway, I've got a few things to, so maybe I'll take questions afterwards when I finish, yeah? I've got a few slides to go through. So the, so we've developed, a, after, after this project, we developed a real-time facial expression system. So let me run this, in, uh, this very quickly and show you what this does. So this, <coughs> this is my, some of my students. So this is a, we've developed a system where we use these patch-based things and then we capture uh, the, uh, the real-time. So you can see for each of these, you know, you can guess this. So this is a real-time system that we've got at the moment. You can see. But we've also tested on real videos. So this is uh, an interview with Robin Williams and David Letchman in 2013. So what we've done is we've taken the video feed in real time and we start we just started analyzing in real time and see what happens. Um, so as you can see, there is his face. And here, you probably might not see it very well, but you can see the emotion, uh, all the emotions, all the six emotions that are uh, coming out. But the interesting thing they found was he looked happy. He looked happy in the interview, he was smiling and things, but most of the time it was negative emotions he was spitting out. So it's interesting, you know, uh, to see that. So one of the things that we do now is if you want to do a facial analysis, we take the video. Um, we, we group those emotions, uh, the positive and negative emotions, and then we work out whether you have positive, overall positive or negative emotions. Because it's very difficult to actually take one emotion and make a judgment based on that. Okay. And then um, recently we started working on facial aging. So this is again uh, one of my PhD students, he's actually working on facial aging. Uh, so to start with, we started actually uh, looking at facial synthesis. So if you've got um, parents, uh, and then if you want to find out what the offspring would look like. <laughs> okay, so uh, we started with some sort of uh, linear relationship here. A child is uh, some sort of parameter 
of uh, a parent one and the parameter parent one, and then we, we start synthesizing, and then we went into some sort of nonlinear. And so we, we took nonlinear transformation, we did some sort of uh, dimension reduction, combined the shape and the texture, and then essentially we come up with a single parameter which defines the face. So uh, we looked at uh, this interesting case where we, we took uh, the image of uh, Kate and William, both at age 32, and we, so we synthesized potential offsprings for them. Uh, so synthesized phases, um, and then what we were obviously looking at is synthesize the phase and then try and age and de age and see what happens. So these are potential thing, uh, potential candidates that we generated out of this. And then based on this, we actually took one phase and started de aging them. And you can see uh, de aging them. So this is at age. Uh, so so that's, that's one experiment that we did. We started de aging them. Uh, and this is we take uh, existing images and we started aging them up. So this is actually predicting it. So this is uh, Charlotte, um, a, a picture. So we took it and we started aging 2, 7, and 20, and so on and so forth. Uh, now you might be asking the question, how do you know that this age works? Yeah? Obviously you ask that question. So a, an easy way to do it is you find known people. Yeah? And they have their pictures also, their young age. So you can start with this, you can de-age and compare with the existing pictures at, at a lower age and then do a face recognition between the two. If the face recognition test passes, then you know fairly well that it works. So we've done that in those experiments and, and this is actually Angelina Jolie and this is our um, de-age face. And this is me. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have too many of my pictures when I was young, so I, I generated one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so this is me at seven, what I would have looked like. Okay, so this is a non-linear model, so we don't use linear, so it's a non-linear model where we actually have taken a big, huge data set, database of people at different ages, and we actually learned it, how, how people age, and then based on that, we do the prediction. Again, you know, this sort of thing is actually, media likes this sort of thing, so we got an interesting media coverage for that. So, uh, for the last part, I'm going to talk about a little bit about face recognition, because this is a recent project that we have been um, working with. Um, so, Last two, uh, about a year and a half, we've been actually working with a company called Acuma Forensics and we're developing a camera system for, the, for this. So how this works is, at the moment, if a suspect gets taken to a police station, you know, they get these mug shots taken. But at the moment, what they do is they, you ask them to st stand still, take a picture, turn around, take a picture like this, yeah? But this is very cumbersome. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a system where uh, the person can sit, and there's these cameras, and with one clip, you take the full face. So you take basically five pictures of the person, and that gives you the full face. Okay? And also you've got a camera at the top, which gives you the CCTV angle as well. So you've got six images of that person in one, one capture. Uh, so this is currently being developed, and uh, it's almost ready to go. Uh, Leicester Chapelis are going to be taking this imaging system into their... Um, police station and also be using it in real time properly and, and collect data. So, th so this is uh, in collaboration with Home Office and Acuma Forensics we're developing. Uh, but the camera was not developed by us, the camera was developed by Acuma Forensics. But what we were interested in is actually putting a face recognition um, system into this. So it's not one-to-one -one comparison we're looking at, it's actually one-to-many comparison, which is the more difficult problem. Yeah, one-to-one -one comparison is easy because you have already a picture, and then you take a picture from your phone or whatever, and then you compare, yeah? But that's easy because, you know, that's, that's easier. So the stuff that you have on, um, on laptops and this for face recognition and authentication is, is kind of one-to-one -one comparison. But one-to-many is you have a huge data set, and then you give a face, and then say, can you pull out the, 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 the nearest image? So, uh, so uh, we'll be looking at intra-subject similarity, in, in, in intra-subject similarity. Uh, uh, high and low in this case. So what we've done is, uh, in fact I can skip this, what we've done is we use image video frames, so we use uh, these layered uh, deep learning environment, so we use uh, layers up to uh, 37 in this case, uh, and then we use the classifier to actually uh, use deep learning. So the way we work is at the moment, so uh, with the hello system we will get at least five images and then what we do is we augment those images 
so we can create, by augmenting, we can create about 200 images or so. And then we feed that into the deep learning uh, system and then and the, it learns about the, uh, that particular person. So we have very deep 39 layer architecture at the moment. And we, I, I have put in 98% accuracy, but this needs to be tested, to be honest, because we've only done on uh, label faces in the world. So the data sets that we have, which I don't know whether this is how accurate it is. So one of the things that we're interested in is getting access to the database that Lester Shapley says they got about 100,000 people. So what we want to do is we want to try and test our algorithm in, in, in that. Um, so that's one of the things that we want to do. So this is the results at the moment. And we were quite surprised with these sort of deep learning algorithms. You know, images like this, the full out the person, you know. Sometimes I can give like part of my, my eye pulls out me, uh, my, my face from the data set. So it's, it's, it's very good. And of course we don't know how it does it, but it actually pulls the, the person, you know. So, so it's, it's very encouraging from that point of view. Uh, so here it is, for example, I get, you know, this is me. It's just part of my eye and then it pulls me out from the data set. Yeah. So it's very powerful from, from a face recognition point of view, it's powerful. And it's, it's almost got um, negligible variation. But the question here is, uh, so one of the things that we want to do is, with this, at the moment the UK police, although you, you, you might be thinking there's a central database with everything in there, but there isn't, unfortunately. So all police forces will work separately in silos. So they will have their own data set, they will have their own ways of actually storing these data sets. So our proposal is, uh, for each force, we will actually take their data set and train locally, and classify locally. And then for each, for each forces, we will do a classifier locally, and all these 43 forces will have 43 classifiers locally trained. And then we can take that classifier into a central system. Because you don't, the main problem with this is if you want to share data, they always say, no, we don't want to share <laughs> our data. So what we're saying is, no, you don't need to share your data, we just give you the algorithm. You, you just do the learning on the algorithm. Yeah, take, Take your data, do the learning, give us the classifier. So we will bring the classifier into a combined system, and then you can do recognition in a central way. So that's our proposal going forward, and hopefully this might work. I don't know. But we're starting with Lester Chapelis, and then there are two other forces that are interested in the camera. So with the camera, we, we, we take the recognition system along with it. So, so there's this been recent progress in, 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 um, in face recognition, and almost all like, you know, things like 1.6 million identities and there's like 95% accuracy. So people might be saying, as far as computer is concerned, maybe the face recognition problem is solved, yeah? But I don't think it is actually solved. There's a, there's a lot of interesting problems to be solved. Uh, so identification, you know, in unconstrained environments are actually a, a huge, huge, huge challenge. And it, it's actually not solved at all. So. Things like illumination, pose, background clutter, image resolution, these are all things that happens even in aging. You're given a passport for 10 years. Mm. By, by, this, by the ninth year, you don't look anything like that passport. <laughs> you know, your face probably, most, most of us don't like anything like that. But then that's where the kind of aging comes in. So you can take a picture, you can, you can take the picture of the passport, you can age it, and then compare. You know, so there's, there's all sorts of things that you need to be doing before you can actually solve this problem. So there's occlusion, partial imaging, and things like that. So here's a question. Do you know what this is? Because I've shown you anyway, yeah? But did you find it difficult to recognize because it's upside down? Yeah. Maybe not you, but... So, psychologists have done these experiments. If the face is upside down, we find it really difficult to recognize. Yeah? But the computer will find it. Yeah? The computer will say it's still Angelina Jolie. But we, we, need, we need extra work to actually recognize it because we have been used to actually recognize faces in the right way. Yeah? Our brain is geared for that. So there's a problem here. In, 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 if, you're, if you're doing like computer versus man versus machine, this is a problem a machine can solve very easily, but a human can't solve it easily. Yeah? So there's, a, there's, a pro, there's pros and cons between machine and this. So there, there it is. Another thing is, they do these exper They did these experiments um, where newborn babies, they haven't seen anything, yeah? They take this smiley face and they put their, the smiley face along their face and they will track. They will track the face. But if you actually did this, they're not bothered. So they're not interested. 
So there's something inherent in our brain which actually recognizes faces and tracks faces from very young age. Yeah, so this is built in. There's, there's something built in in our, in, in our head. And we don't really know how humans actually recognize faces. Certainly it's not deep learning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is deep learning, I don't know, because we, we don't actually go to that level of detail. You know. Perhaps, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at is, is it the average face? There's, there's a, my gut feeling is what we do is we create an average face from that person. So I can see angels a few times, and in my brain, the average of angels is in my head. So I can, whichever course I look at it, I can compare with that average and then recognize you. Maybe. Maybe this. You know. so, so there's all sorts of questions that need to be answered in terms of how humans recognize faces. And you, pr you probably would have heard um, super recognizers. Have you heard? 